September 15th, it's about 2.23 p.m. Hello. Hello. Doing very Hello. well. Obama photo, look at that. Oh, oh yeah. Goodness. Yeah, every once in a while I come across those. Yeah, right. I feel dots at it. Yeah, thank you. All right, have a good day. <laughs> I suppose that man might have been familiar with the Obama coin. Recognized it right off the bat. He called it Obama Quarter. There was a Bud Light truck that just went right behind you, dude. <laughs> was it in the shot? Yeah. Oh, man. Wow. As it goes by, I'm going to have to have go, go, go. But, uh... <laughs> Well, I think the First Amendment still applies to publicly accessible areas. It does not apply. Well, thank you for refraining from doing the court property. What would happen if one were to continue chalking? It's called disorderly conduct. So the police would be called? Look, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just asking questions. I don't questions. care. I'm not I know arguing. you've got your camera on. I don't care. I'm just telling you what it is. We'll call the police. We'll deal with it. Okay. Well, I think that the police would agree that one has a right to I'm not arguing themselves. with you. I'm not arguing either. I'm just expressing nice what I understand to be the law. Have a seat. Well, I had no... I did do a chalking just right here. This is on the sidewalk. Manic was chalking here on this one little instep. Um, and I had no plans on chalking in front of the courthouse today, but... Since it's been said that we can't, I feel that I'm, I'm just going to have to disagree with that. And uh, do chalking is a human right right here. I've just done chalking as a human right. You've done have a seat. <laughs> Which is actually an homage to the judge who sits here, right? He, it's one of his catchphrases. In fact, they said to have a seat earlier to Ian, I do believe. He doesn't even want to stop. Oh boy. <laughs> He's like, I ain't bothering. I don't know. We might want to get this video into somebody else's hands though, in case they want to take us in. I won't trust them, they're toddlers. He's not even stopping. <laughs> Was that Timmy? I do not know. Whoever it was, they're like, I'm not stopping. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just heading out of here. <laughs> 
This is not worth my time. <laughs> my effort, my energy, or the paperwork. <laughs> yeah, I think the only point at which the police would do anything, I mean, we've, we've covered this slate. I think we could do that slate. I think we'd do that one too. Maybe right there they'd say we're blocking the door or something. Or on the building itself, if you put chalk on the, the vertical walls, that would be something that they do. But here, I mean, they can't do much of anything. Here comes another police car. Let's see if they're interested in showing up. Yeah, it looks like they're stop stopping to pull over. Where's Timmy? Get Timmy back here. No. You want to record with this if you don't have another one? Yes, there? I do, actually. <laughs> Something happens, cut, you call, I don't know the numbers, nobody happens, you get your phone immediately. Alright, this is recording. It should be cool, it's broadcasting live, so you're live streaming. Right. Just hold it uh, horizontal, please. Oh. Yeah. Hello. I guess that wasn't for us. So, uh, to catch our live stream audience up to speed, if there is anybody watching right now, um, on this videotape, you will see a video of, we can move this way, it looks like people are going to be coming in. Um, video of uh, Manic out chalking here, and then a security guard came out and said that you can't do that here, this is not the public sidewalk, and we're just one slate away from the public sidewalk. And the entryway, which is a very public entryway to the courthouse here, it's a horizontal sidewalk entranceway. Um, I guess it's the same type of material as the sidewalk, it's cement. And I asked what was going to happen if people continued chalking, and he didn't really say specifically, just that he's not going to argue. I said, well, I'm not arguing with anyone. I'm just stating ideas and asking questions. And it's unfortunate when people are, when you have a question or you, have, you want to, uh, you know, analyze what they're saying or try and understand it, and they'll be like, I'm not arguing. Well, nobody needs to argue at any point. They can always just consider things and discuss things civilly. So I'm waiting here to see if there's a uh, civil discourse that's going to occur with the police officer. Fed one roll by and look, <coughs> excuse me, and kept going. Another is stopped here, but he was going into court. He wasn't stopping for us. And over here it says, have a seat. It says, chalking is a human right. It says, we are not afraid to express ourselves. And over here it says, AKPF number one. And yeah, I don't, I don't see any reason why um, one would think that they wouldn't be able to chalk here. This is a great place to chalk. In fact, they'll even go up a little closer to the door. And one right here. One right here. And that's not, I don't expect any criminal charges are gonna come from that. I mean, I'm just expressing myself and expressing happiness. People should be smiling. I mean, it's up to them, but I recommend it. Um, so yeah, I guess I don't want them to also be able to divert us away from the activity that we were engaged in, which is Robin Hooding, um, trying to stay ahead of the AKPF agents to prevent them from issuing tickets. So I don't want to get too distracted from that activity. It looks like they're not coming back out here. And KPD doesn't seem to be expressing any interest. They've got officers here. If it's such an emergency for them, I'm sure they could send them out of this building. Um, but yeah, I guess we can consider uh, continuing on our way. I believe the same SUV that passed by earlier is still not coming down the street. All right, Monday, March 17th, 933, here in West Memphis. We got uh, vehicle number D as in David, 26. Looks like he just printed something out is honestly what it looks like. So uh, I don't know, unfortunately maybe there's some uh, Revenue generation, some road pirate activity happening. Oh. 
How you doing, sir? How you doing, sir? How are you? Good. Can I ask your name and badge number? Be well, yo. Oh, is that? Well, can I get your name and badge number, please? Yeah, you can. Was there a victim today? Why these gentlemen were stopped? Or a victim? Yes, sir. Talk to the state, thank you. Can I talk to the state of Arkansas? I mean, could they testify that they were harmed or their property was damaged? I don't know. Yeah, that's. I guess that's kind of the point I'm trying to make. I don't know, like, if there's no damage to personal property. See this here? Yes, sir. Uh, it looks like it says uh, regulations. Yeah. Uh huh. So, I mean, whatever they put in that book, though. I mean, Today, that all black beef was going to be taken. I wouldn't what make if, it. What if the sky was blue? I can't answer what if. Well, I just do my job with my building. What they pay me to do? Well, you could answer what if, if, if you're tasked with something, you could choose not to enforce it if you don't agree with it. If my purpose for taking a job was to serve and protect, and then I was, uh, you know, stopping folks from engaging in victimless acts, I would wonder if there was a conflict there. Oh, I don't? Okay. Well, it's a pretty simple concept. If there's no victim, there's no crime. And that's what I'm trying to communicate and trying to get your input on. But if you go back to the Star Wars, <laughs> Yeah, but I don't know. Again, I don't know if I can talk to the state of Arkansas. If they can tell me, yes, I was damaged in this way, then I can understand. But... You see all these problems Yeah. That's the state of Arkansas. Okay. Well, I guess we have a different... Uh, Understanding then on yeah. what what uh, constitutes a, a, a party that could be injured. The individuals have rights. Groups of people don't have any more rights. If you have certain, you have the same rights as I do, as those gentlemen had. And if we get together, there's no extra rights created from that. Where are you from? I'm from New Hampshire. What's your name? My name's Pete. My name's Gabriel. Gabriel, good to see you. Yeah, man. Yeah, exactly. So if I want to come up talk to anybody, I, I have the right. No, exactly. And that's the thing that I try to emphasize is like individuals act, they're responsible for their actions no matter where they work. But the thing is, uh, you know, there's uh, claims of, of immunity, sovereign immunity, acting under color of law and things like that, which say, well, if you're, if you're working in these capacities and you, and you harm somebody's rights, then you might not be liable unless we say it's okay to sue them. So there is a different standard and that's... That's why, uh, you know, I get out here and I film and, and whatnot. You know what the Second Amendment is? Sure, but, I mean, again, I don't look to pieces of paper for my rights. I think someone born in North Korea has the same right of self-defense as someone does here. It's a God-given right. But, uh, but we have those so that the government can't. You know, that's our, that's our law. You can't, the government can't take that from us. Well, it's, it hasn't worked too well. Because ultimately, I think ideas is what's going to make the difference. So, I mean, I'm not trying to be adversarial. I'm just trying to uh, share ideas and try, try to get point out. Like, if you, you know, you seem like a, a, a nice dude, Gabriel. And so, if you, I mean, if you took the job with good intentions, and then you think about, well, like I just, you know, I these, I don't know if those, you know, guys were hardworking or what their story is, but I mean, now that maybe they have to, they said they have to pay some money, and I don't see a victim. There's, I don't see someone who's like got damaged. I don't see property. They, I mean, I don't know the situation, but to be honest, but. You know, to yeah. me, it's a big thing. If there's no victim, there's no crime. And for a group of people that, that claim a monopoly on providing justice and security to shake someone down for, for not doing anything wrong, that sets the stage for more egregious rights violations. So I just, you know, I'm just, just trying to have a conversation about it. And I'm not trying to say it's you personally. It's, it's the like the institution and it's, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, and that's also well, where it comes down to. I get up every day and I pay people. Yeah. Yeah. I don't pay my taxes. I don't have a choice. I do both. I go to work every day and do the best of my ability. Yeah. That's the best of my job. Right. Whether there's people out there that do things that are not. 
No, that's good. I, I that's, do my own thing, and I, uh, yeah. I, I try to go by policy, by the letter of the law. I think most people are generally good. They don't, they're don't. they not out there to, to harm somebody else knowingly. And, uh, yeah. so well, it's just, unfortunately, I can't. And that's the thing. I mean, it, it, without these these centralized uh, vehicles, like uh, you know, Hitler would have just been some crazy racist dude on the corner. Without like, if, if people didn't, uh, if, if he didn't get elected, and then he had his hands in the pockets of millions of people, and millions of people saying, "Yes, I have to obey you because you have this certain title." If we all govern ourselves, and uh, you know, we don't grant this authority arbitrarily, but we grant it to people who earn it people that we can trust and have proven themselves there's a big difference and that's that's my thing like today uh you know like the person who says he, he rules over everybody in this political boundary called the u.s he, he uh, signed some legislation that says i have a right to, to kidnap and cage somebody indefinitely i have a right to kill somebody you know without cause i have a right to do all these things and he doesn't have that right any more than you and i do it's just that people believe does so they grant this legitimacy so what the, the solution is is to, to withdraw the consent from that violent apparatus and from these double standards and whatnot. I mean 70 years ago someone in the same position put out a piece of paper that we're gonna round up all the Japanese Americans and they put 110,000 people in concentration camps in the states and I mean what's to stop that from happening again you know if the authority is still granted to that corrupt institution it could so that's that's why I'm trying to get out there that's why I'm a firm believer in second all right. You know, you gotta protect yourself. Man. Right. When it comes down to it, you gotta take care of yourself. Yeah, right on. Yeah, man. But yeah, I don't mean to take up all your day, but I appreciate you talking and being pretty, you know, candid and whatnot. It's a friendly conversation. That's really what I'm, you know, seek to do. And I, I, I'm here for the people, man. Yeah. I just do what, I just do what, yeah. Do what they train me to do, and uh, you know, I got a family. Yeah. Yeah. You got a family or you just... no I don't have any kids or anything right now I, have, I mean I have other family but yeah. yeah I mean if I had honestly if I had kids I'd, I couldn't do this kind of lifestyle you know where I travel yeah, a lot stuck, but yeah I've been able to meet a lot of good people going around and I guess that's one reason I'm pretty optimistic and pretty trusted and, and whatnot I just yeah. you know oh, man, just, just be careful don't 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 let that be your advice Sure. I don't think you're naive. Yeah. I'm just saying that there's some people. No. Are I hear you. That, yeah. You know, you're kind of hard. That's just that's a rare thing. Hey. Well, have a good day. I'll be let you go. Me. Yeah, you as well. Yeah, be well. Take care. Don't get in Oh, for sure. <laughs> if you do go to the site and you, and you check out just one video, I said, there's a guy named Dale Brown from Detroit that has a pretty good little operation that it's kind of doing what you know what you. Uh, uh, set out as your aims to protect people and whatnot, but it does it through like a consensual interaction. He's got a business model. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, honestly, where I'm from now is like my mindset is like I don't mean it's to sound harsh to you personally, but I don't want to take a job that subsists on money that's taken from other people. Yeah, I well, appreciate. I think you'd like it. Yeah. Hard, yeah. Well, I mean, I. I'd, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, be safe. Yeah. Hey, what's up, y'all? Pete here. I want to make a video not on yet another instance of police employee abuse, but a book review. Uh, a book by Michael Quinn called Walking with the Devil. I learned of this book a couple weeks ago from my friends uh, based here in Minnesota, Paul Leeson, who started Minnesota Cop Block, and Drew Henderson, who since joined them him there and who you may know of, uh, he had a little incident that happened in Little Canada. Walking with the Devil, The Police Code of Silence, What Bad Cops Don't Want You to Know and Good Cops Won't Tell You, came out in 2005. The author, Mike Quinn, worked for Minneapolis Police for almost 24 years. The main thrust of the book is to encourage current police employees to do the right thing to abstain from involvement with the code of silence. The code, 
as Quinn says in the book, is the singularly most powerful influence on police behavior in the world, as much a part of being a cop as the badge and the gun. And yet he pulls back the curtain on the code, saying that it's really about lies and deception, and ultimately that it destroys the trust people have in cops. Quinn outlines scenarios and real-world examples in which the allure and ease of just going along with the code may be tempting, but he appeals to one's integrity and the oath sworn to uphold as more worthwhile pursuits. Quinn admits that every day in newspapers we can find another instance of police abuse or criminal behavior. He acknowledges that police employees' use of creative report writing and test lying is commonplace. He also takes aim at drug prohibition, which he cites as the direct cause for the change in police philosophy from protect and serve to convict and incarcerate, and he includes in his book a list of police employee whistleblowers and the 10 myths of policing, in which he refutes in over 30 pages the belief of some police employees that in order to achieve justice, they must be heavy-handed. Overall, I agree with much of Quinn's assessments, though I feel he stopped short in some key areas, which I'll get to in just a moment. Though we share a common end goal to rid policing of the code of silence, the means that he advocates using to do that won't be effective, and that he admits. Knowing we will never eliminate it, we can prepare ourselves by analyzing how the code of silence works. Quinn's solution? Perhaps increase educational requirements and better on-the-job training, but ultimately he points to individuals acting within the current structure. We can change the police culture from within, he claims. If just one cop stands up and says no more, many cops will stop their legal and unethical acts in the presence of that cop. But is that really a deterrent? For the unjust actions to continue just outside of sight? I personally don't believe it accurate to call someone good when they remain silent about the actions of another. Think about it this way. If that police employee would have arrested or charged you for engaging me in the same act, failure to do so to a colleague means they're in the wrong and that they act according to double standards. Quinn admits the very real inertia built into the police institution. As long as cops are investigating cops, the code of silence will usually prevail and the public will never get a true picture of what is going on in the street. And unless the motivation is extremely powerful, like being sent to prison, cops don't tell on other cops. If Quinn were serious about ending the code of silence, he would encourage police employees to not just let their colleagues know of their disapproval, but to go public with it, no matter the risks. The police employee that is aware of misdeeds done by colleagues could go to police accountability advocates or reporters as is increasingly being done every day, or they could create an outlet and share the information anonymously. Or, as Adrian Schoolcraft did when his NYPD colleagues were up to no good, they could capture audio or video of the misdeeds and make that public. Those tactics would afford an entirely new magnitude of insight and transparency into the closed ranks of policing, which are now protected by this code of silence. Though Quinn only mentions it once in the entire book, a much more effective tactic than believing police will police themselves is the introduction of a camera. When confronted with video camera footage or audio recordings, the code becomes a trap. The first cop to tell the truth is usually the one to escape permanent damage. The camera simply captures the truth, and the truth is a very powerful disinfectant. Quinn wrote that most cops don't start their careers believing the ends justify the means. Then he says that the explanation on the adoption of the code of silence isn't easy. While I agree with the first part of the statement, most police employees don't start out with evil intentions, I disagree strongly with the second part of his statement, that the causes are amorphous or complex. They're not. It comes down to incentives. This is my biggest point of divergence from Quinn, what I see as a failure to recognize the fact that policing as an institution has a flawed foundation, and because of that, the code of silence can never be uprooted completely. In no uncertain terms, the core of the policing apparatus is based on coercion. It says a certain group of people has a right to steal from others under the guise of protecting them. The code of silence is but a destructive attribute of that toxic environment. They are inseparable. Acknowledging that is key to understanding why the code of silence exists. While Quinn correctly pointed out that this wasn't a local or regional problem, he claimed it was a nationwide problem. But in fact, it is an international problem that exists anywhere a group of people claims and is granted the right to do things said to be wrong for others. If our communities knew the truth, Quinn wrote, they would never approve of some of the things we do in the name of justice. If the truth were out there, many would see past the illusions that allow these institutions and the code to exist. Police employees would cease to be seen as a monolith, and any claims of extra protection afforded to their actions would evaporate. Instead, they'd be seen as individuals responsible for their actions, as are you and I. Quinn started the first chapter of his book with a quote by Edmund Burke, It is necessary only for the good man to do nothing for evil to triumph. It's one we're all familiar with, 
and it's one we need to act upon if we really do want to make a positive change. Shortly after I learned of this book, I reached out to Mike Quinn to see if he'd sit down to do an interview. Initially, he accepted, but soon after, he recanted. Uh, when I inquired why, what the rationale for that was, he said that he had checked out the site and he had found some of the language used on some of the posts more inflammatory than necessary. I responded I agreed with him in that assessment that some of the language is more inflammatory than necessary, but I tried to reiterate the fact that the site is decentralized, so each piece of content only speaks for the author themselves and not for all involved. But to his credit, Quinn, um, you know, as he stressed throughout the book, the, the integrity and the, and the importance of the that characteristic, he, he noted that in the past he used to write for Officer.com, but that he chose to disassociate himself with that site after some other authors there put up some content about uh, police employees being immune for their actions. Now, 24 hours a day by armed men and people throughout the city enforcing their mandate. During Ramadan, as they headed to the local market. <laughs>